So our next speaker, we're very fortunate to have uh, Christina Bethel with us. Christina is the founding director of the Child and Adolescent Health Measurement uh, Institute uh, at the Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health at Johns Hopkins University. She also leads the National Data Resource Center for Child and, Adol and Adolescent Health. Uh, if you're looking at any data that has to do with, with child health and adolescent health in this country, you're likely looking at, at data that uh, Christina has profoundly shaped. Um, she's one of the leading voices in, de in developing collaborative approaches to using this data to shape systems that meet the needs of, of children, uh, adolescents, and families. Uh, Christina has a very provocative uh, talk for us looking at We Are the Medicine, Human Development and Child Well-Being in an Era of Ordinary Magic. Christina. Great. Thank you. So thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to report to you from the alcoves of maternal and child health epidemiology, where I've had the great opportunity to spend the last 20 or 25 years of my life uh, looking into what you might think of as the social genome of maternal and child and family health in this country. And my focus has been on figuring out how to measure what it is we're up to, what we care about, and then also look at the performance and the functioning of the systems, the maternal and child health systems and programs that we fund to see if there's a connection. And also to try to insert measures to get a little bit ahead of the science and see whether what we hypothesize is making a difference actually looks like it's making a difference, like family and child relationships or adverse childhood experiences, which many people are talking about these days. And in the last couple years, my journey has taken me back east. I've been a West Coaster my entire life. And so it's taken me a little while to get adjusted. But just in the last month, I've become a proud owner of a Baltimore City row home. And as I was preparing for this talk, the builder let me know that I have a nail in the cable in the wall, so I can't get connected. And, you know, of course, he's really worried about it because he's going to have to rip the wall down and take the nails out, whoever put it together, and get me rewired. So I took this as an opportunity to respond to him. He's a child. He has two small children at home. And I said, and I say, he said to me, do you really need to be connected, jokingly? And I said, yeah, I need to be connected. And did you know that we all need to be connected? And in fact, the most important or one of the most important things to the well-being of your children is the safety, stability, and nurturing qualities of your relationship with them. And no matter what's going on in your life, that's always possible. That's always possible. And disruptions in those connections make us go haywire. And depending on what comes up along with those disruptions, to buffer, to protect us, to nurture us, sometimes we get nails in our cable and we can't get connected, and we have to rip the wall down and take the nails out and help restore connection, and that this is really critical. And what we know, some of the types of experiences that can disrupt that safety and stability and nurturing qualities of relationship are what some people call adverse childhood experiences, which we're fortunate enough to measure nine of these on the National Survey of Children's Health. About half of children in the country experience one or more of these nine, and about 23% two or more. And while I was talking to the builder, I happened to actually have a young magical child, who I will call Sweet Pea, with me. It was a Saturday, and I've been spending time with her because she actually has experienced a lot of adverse childhood experiences. And some of the issues that she's dealing with are emotional, mental, and behavioral in nature. And what we know from the data is that there's about five times greater odds of children who've experienced four or more adverse childhood experiences to have an emotional, mental, or behavioral issue. And Sweet Pea has eight. An alcoholic mother, uh, definitely divorce, economic hardship, mental health problems in the home, a father who is in jail, and other events like that. So the data in our epidemiologic world is very strong. Any one, which I've listed here, 
has about two times greater odds, up to two times greater odds. It's really the cumulative risk that is the biggest problem. So Sweepy asked me, she said, I was talking to her about this talk, and she said, you know, can I write a poem? Because one of the things we do is a lot of poetry and art and movement, which are some of the things that we're finding are really helpful to children in learning. And I'm also teaching her mindfulness, which is something that I do on the side, is teach mindfulness. And so she wrote a poem, and I told her I would read it, I would recite it to you if I thought there was time or if it was appropriate. And based on our conversation so far, I think I will do that. So she calls the poem, Only Begins. I'm calling it my trauma-informed ode to epigenetics and the microbiome. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, I'm just going to read two stanzas. So the first part is, I am in the world, from her, I am in the world and the world is in me. From my toes to my nose to my belly to my knees. What's in is out. What's out is in. Endings can't be endings because there's only begins. And I thought, that's interesting. What do you mean by that? She says, well, that's what I call this, begins. I have to stay in the begins and, and not, not get stuck. But sometimes I get stuck. And I don't know I'm stuck because I'm stuck, and that's why I need to come and talk to you. Because you remind me and help me, and we need each other. And the parents can do that for their children if they can do it for themselves. So the second stanza, and then I'll stop there, was more about what begins are. And she says, begins are like flowers that lean toward the light. When I'm aware of what's there, it's never really night. The scariest of scaries are just frights from before. I'm almost never afraid of what's actually at my door. But when she's stuck, she can't see what's at her door. And that's why we keep working. So not everyone is as lucky as Sweet Pea. And what we're finding is that it's equally unequal. When you have exposures to adverse childhood experiences, if you don't have, it's about 14.2% of all children in the country are having, being identified as having an emotional, mental, or behavioral problem, developmental problem. However, across all income groups, regardless, that rate is around 35 to 40% once you have four or more. So it's very true that if you're in a lower income group, you're much more likely to have a higher number of adverse childhood experiences. But once you have them, and adjusting for everything we're able to adjust for, it's really uh, a common outcome. And unfortunately, we do see what you would expect. We measure flourishing, a very sort of low bar way of measuring flourishing. And even at that, we're seeing that across the continuum of cumulative risk for adverse childhood experiences, uh, flourishing has a linear downward spiral, as we were expecting. And of course, problems like having a special health care need, being obese, putting ob even ob overweight aside, just obesity, and special health care needs, and other such things, that it's upwards of 82%, 83% for children with four or more adverse childhood experiences. The income differential around this is not very wide. And the most important thing that we're finding, based on life course literature and some of the few things that have been able to be put in the national survey, is that maternal health matters. We indeed need to put the M back in maternal and child health, and also probably the F, maternal and child and family health. Um, so what we're finding is that if a child has no ACEs, about 68.3% of mothers are in excellent and very good health. If there's one, it's about 48. And if it's two or more, remember Sweet Pea had eight. 35.8%, and I can tell you, Sweet Pea's mom is not doing very well. That's why she comes to talk to me, and many, many other people. It's taking a village. So two, one year and two days ago, I was opening the panel in Baltimore for a healing forum to address these issues. And it took us about a year to put this forum together, and our panel was on the neuroscience, epigenetics, and social psychology of trauma, what it is, and how to heal it. And just as I was introducing the panel, which was April 20th, 2015, how many of you know what was going on on April around that time in Baltimore? There were a lot of riots. And Freddie Gray, as of the evening before, was still alive. But that morning, everybody knew that he had died, and we were in a room with a sold-out crowd of 800. It was a community event, by the way. The police chief was in the room, the school superintendent, and many other people. So while there was trauma that day, there was also a sense of magic, what Ann Maston might call ordinary magic. 
So Anne Mastin's come out with a book to synthesize what do we know about resilience in childhood and in development. And this research began um, after World War II to really understand why it was that children who were exposed to similar types of experiences in the war, some were doing much better than others. So this research has been around for a very, very long time and is an opportunity for us to translate it. And now there's a whole neuroscience that supports the adaptive systems that she's summarizing with a lot of literature, so I encourage you to look at it. The first adaptive system is our relationships. And this is what I was talking about before, effective parents and caregivers and connections to other competent and caring adults. That's the core. That's first, actually. Before a child can learn their own capacity building, those relationships need to be there to help with that. Uh, at least for very young children, I think that's generally what the research would say. So then there's the child cap capabilities to learn to self-regulate, to be aware of the fact that they are stressed, their breathing, body awareness, problem-solving skills, how to free up that uh, executive function and be able to see what's happening and solve problems. Positive beliefs about self are incredibly important and to be aware when we're not having positive beliefs. You know, some of the trainings in this say, what's the voice in your head that you hear every day that you wish wasn't there and everybody has that voice? How do we work? work with that and stay in a positive, empowered place within ourselves. Beliefs, about the, beliefs that life has meaning and spirituality and faith. And of course, the last tier is community and environment, which also has a, a capacity for resilience or lack of resilience, and that families are within communities and environments, and children are within families, and it all goes together. And the research that um, we've been doing and the data that we have from MCH Epidemiology supports this. So where there's a very simple aspect of resilience that's measured in the national survey, which is really just that ability for a child to stay calm and in control when faced with a challenge, something that we find parents can report on. Um, and what you find for the younger children, 6 to 11, who have special health care needs and two or more adverse events. So first thing, just to back up for a minute, if a child has exposure to adverse childhood experiences, they're much more likely to be identified as having a special health care need, about 36%. Of those children who have two or more, this is the rate of being engaged in school, the bottom half, um, without resilience, with this basic aspect of resilience. And the top is the engagement rate for those who, who are reported to have um, even just a basic aspect of resilience, a dramatic effect, especially for the young kids. And this is just what it looks like across the age continuum. And this plays out also with the prevalence of emotional, mental, or behavioral conditions, which are, um, to some, some people are th thinking almost an epidemic in this country, with a basic aspect of resilience and um, no ACEs, about 6.4, 8.4, and then 16.1. However, without that, this is what it looks like. I'm trying to go to the next one. So what is it that is allowing some children to experience resilience and other children not after we control for a lot of other variables. And it's what you would think. It's a relationship, at least a certain piece of this really, for what we can measure, is very connected to their relationships. So if a child has an adult mentor, the probability, and four or more ACEs, so I'm looking at a high-risk group and normalizing around, they both have emotional mental problems and also have experienced four or more ACEs. About 33% are experiencing resilience if they even just have parents where they share ideas about things that matter, that that's something that happens in their home, about 41%. However, if a parent reports above average levels of, of aggravation with their child, we know a certain amount of that's normalized, but above average, um, the probability the child has resilience is very low. And this is what re resilience looks like without adult mentor, without sharing basic communication with parents and of course, with high levels of parental aggravation. So what Dr. Um, what the last, what we were just talking about is very, very important, um, working with parents. So again, flourishing overall, which is a broader concept than just staying calm and in control when faced with the challenge, is much higher as well with meaningful sharing, normal parent aggravation, parent reporting, I usually cope well, so we're not talking about perfection, and then that the parent participates, knows most of the child's friends, and attends their events, usually, not always. And again, without these in place and four or more ACEs, 
the probability of flourishing uh, goes down. So I've been working recently with the, some folks at the Children's Hospital Association to do a national poll with that and many others um, because there's a sense that we don't really think children are doing very poorly. There's a sense that, that the Congress maybe doesn't think that children actually need much. You know, they're doing better than we were doing. And, you know, I mean, they might be a little overweight and wheeze, but, you know, basically they're okay. These are the kind of things that, that I, was, I was hearing that I was shocked by. So the poll is really meant to find out if that's true. What does the American public think? And so this came out on Monday, and about over 50% of um, the adults in the poll reported that they thought children today did not have as good a chance at thriving as they did. And in particular, the issues that are named have to do with quality family time, coping and staying positive. Quality personal relationships was about the same, but stress levels in particular, there is a recognition that children today are experiencing high levels of stress and not necessarily um, on board with that capacity to cope and stay positive. So Dr. Liu yesterday told you about this New Horizons report which has a lot of themes in it and recommendations in it that align with what we're talking about this morning. What he didn't tell you is this came out in 2001. It's been 15 years. We have a lot of knowledge that we could, in a rapid cycle learning way, be implementing much more quickly. Personal ties, positive health development, healthy communities are right in the centerpiece of this for a reason, and the science is behind much of this. We do have quite a bit of research on training around mindfulness and its, in, its effect on the brain and healing the parts of the brain that can be uh, not wired up necessarily in a way that allows us to function well. Um, I wonder if we're suffering from what I call, a, the, well, I don't call, it's called the hard, easy cognitive bias. So we've had information for a long time. Here's just an article on how do, writing out a narrative, telling the story of your life experience and any trauma you've experienced actually improves immune function. And so we know the healing power of having a coherent narrative. We also know having a coherent narrative, the mother having a coherent narrative is one of the strongest predictors of having a healthy attachment to the child her own understanding of her life, not necessarily what happened, that there's a way that she's come to integrate it and understand it, is what's predicting the healthy attachment to the child. We also, a study which I absolutely love that came out last year, is just by doing a brief intervention with youth with depression, it was a randomized intervention trial, letting them know that you can change you're not going to always have to be this way if you don't like something about yourself or your life having a developmental orientation toward life, a growth mindset, which is not something many people have, even if they think. There's a sense of getting stuck, you know? Um, but there's a transformative power in just instilling a growth mindset that we um, haven't necessarily trained on. There is some progress in bringing some of these ideas into home visiting and maternal child health, but I think we could really do a lot to fast track that and learn quickly through the innovation networks that Dr. Liu was talking about. So the hard, easy cognitive bias is where we might think that something is easy, easier than it is, or the opposite. And I think there's a lot of these kind of interventions, like the kangaroo care that I know um, Dr. Darmstead talked about last uh, time, isn't necessarily implemented. Is it too easy? And maybe we're really confused about how the things that seem the easiest and seem the softest might be the hardest because they involve our own self-awareness and capacity to look at ourselves and change ourselves. So I'm saying it's time to make personalized medicine actually personal and um, engaging people. There's a, a growing mind-body literature. Um, here's an article on laughter therapy for cancer, which if those of you who don't know the literature, I'm looking at it um, a lot more. And of course, it was in 1972, I think, that the anatomy of an illness came out with Norman Cousins um, around positive emotions and their effect on the body and how to uh, bring those about. So I'd say we have a We Are the Medicine platform where our science, we are very, it's very important that our science, our lived experience, and now I think our policy opportunity are finally meeting, where we recognize that ours is a social brain and that this makes relationships, self-awareness, and I'd say mindfulness a matter of public health. So this um, call to a We Are the Medicine platform 
I'm calling a new science of thriving. And here's just a couple of the, the principles that um, I'll share with you today for your consideration. The first is that um, this new science of thriving, which has to be very, very integrative, um, concerns itself with the capacity for positive human development, even in the face of adversity, and that we need to address that as a parallel path that frames well-being as a learned capacity. Many of the requirements for our well-being are understood, and we don't take seriously necessarily shifting ourselves or supporting each other, whether it's in families, communities, or even organizations, to learn. The place is the locus of human health within the uh, social, emotional, and environmental context that we actually are co-creating and have an impact on, balances the conventional focus on illness and risk and disease with an equally strong, explicit focus on strengths and what is already right and what is already whole, and innovates to engage. And this sort of era of innovation is really critical, that we start to fund in ways that allow learning. And we know that that often doesn't happen, and we wait uh, until things are proven, but we can't prove them without the fast-track learning. So I'm hoping that there can be a lot more to, to scale. And then finally, really focuses on the social and emotional skills that underlie a lot of the capacity to be well and to build resilience. So I'm going to end with six wishes for maternal and child health. And the first is to free our brilliance by aligning our values with our investments and our policies. But I will start back with what are our values, and do we value childhood, and do we value families in this country? And so maybe that's really where we need to start. But if we do, we have a lot of information about the types of policies we can put in place um, that might um, help us with that. So I believe that we have a lot of brilliance and capacity that is not being freed because we're locked inside of the systems and the financing mechanisms that um, are in play right now. The, th the second is to take on transparency, to be more curious than afraid, to learn about how is it going, and be really open to that feedback loop that we need to be open to, to learn, and to also innovate around measurement. So if there's something called a well-be, which would be a well-being well adjusted life year. Um, some people are working on a growth domestic potential measure. There are other measures like that, and we just got done scanning about 870 maternal and child health measures that are used by about 12 different programs in the country in maternal and child health, and looking at topics and what they share in common and opportunities for alignment. And there are very, very few that speak to the issues that uh, we're talking about today. My third wish is, hang on, to become what I'm calling we ninjas, to just acknowledge that first we haven't really put the we in wellness, and we're not necessarily as successful about collaboration across sectors, across disciplines, and even within teams. And that that's OK if we can have a developmental orientation to that. I think we can get much better. Many businesses are investing a great deal in how to train around working in teams. And that if we can take the hit that, you know, it doesn't go that well often. And the big successes that we see in community, um, community partnerships and things like that that often falter when, um, in, through the, because of the relationships. We know that medical errors are often about failures in communication and teamwork. So really taking seriously and, and getting good at the we. Prioritizing possibility as the basis from which we then turn toward the trauma, that there's more right with you than wrong with you. It's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. And that there is a lot of assets that we have and strengths that we have that we don't leverage from. And so to really, really focus on that is an important piece to then turn toward the trauma and be able to take on trauma. I'm calling this, um, my, actually my colleague Anat Boniel, who wrote Kids Beyond Limits, calls it from fixing to connecting. And she, she does a great deal of neuro movement type work with children with autism and so on, getting great success. And really the main thing is before beginning, making sure you're actually connected, which is a felt experience. Um, I call it the triple T. If I take all the neuroscience and things that I've been learning and think about, well, what would the public health practices be to take on trauma? I'd say time in a self-reflection practice where we actually attune and have that sense of self-regulation in ourselves so that we can actually bring that. Uh, time with, where we actually understand that belonging and being with each other um, is critical. And when we're not and we feel disconnected, a lot goes on that's sort of making us go haywire, even in terms of our ability to be creative. And time for, 
that everyone has something to give, no matter where they are in the continuum of their own disease, everyone has something to offer, and that sense of identity that I matter, I have something to give. There's a growing amount of research on the importance of, of, of giving and contributing and having mastery. So my final wish is to brave being, to recognize that this quality of being, um, our being is very important to the well-being of children and that there's self-care work that we may need to do in healing our own trauma, for example, and that to activate what I'm calling the presence effect, that effect that we can all feel when we're actually connected, is an essential part of making sure that we bring the science that we have to um, helping children. So those child care workers, those home visitors, those Head Start teachers, those teachers, those parents, all are also needing support to develop their own well-being, and that self-care is a critical part of being able to care for one another. So that's my last wish, and I'm going to be going back to Baltimore tomorrow morning, and we've already started a discussion. This is the banner that I saw when I came off the plane on July 2nd, 2014. And I had a conversation with uh, the communications department there about, I thought it was missing something. Uh, so public health has no boundaries. The air we breathe, the food we eat, public health impacts us all. And something along the lines of how we connect, I think is equally uh, important and that we have the science to support that. So if you don't mind, since I have just a couple minutes, I'm going to go ahead and end with another poem. And it's called Improbable People. So improbable people always lay low. They take short sips and never throw fits. There are things that only they know. Like love is real, but hard to feel. When the screen was so blank and only God to thank for that nightlight hung on the soul. Research would say they shouldn't be this way, but love sprung out their improbable outspout until eventually even they ran dry. Improbably then, the real journey begins, held down with a howl, an inspout installed, pain rising up to be skimmed. So they start having fits and taking long sips, and people smile wide, God beams with pride, held strong in the love that they grew from that place that already knew, these, the improbable few. And I would like to dedicate the rest of my career with all of you to making the improbable few, the improbable many. And I think we are living in a time where that is possible. So, thank you. Christina, thank you so much as we've been talking a lot about science and a lot about the importance of very early events. I really appreciate that you helped all of us realize how we're all connected, how we all have a role to play, yep. how there's great hope yep. for people who have experienced adverse um, circumstances and that we can all play a role in helping them overcome yeah. uh, those adversities. So thank you very much. Thank you, absolutely. Uh, I'd like to open it up for some questions. In the National Survey of Children's Health, first of all, if you go to childhealthdata.org, which is one of our websites, um, and you search for flourishing, it, the items will pop right up. Um, I don't know if Dr. Liu's in the room, but I proposed 39 items, and then I thought it was going to be nine, and then I think it went down to five, and I think we have four uh, for kids six to 17, but it includes being able to stay calm and in control when faced with a challenge. Uh, being able to, uh, being curious and interested in learning new things, being able to, when you start something, um, usually or always finish that task, and being participate participating socially and um, in events in the, in the community and at school. So that's for youth, that's for school-age children. And if you look at flourishing, it's a much bigger concept, so it's a very basic uh, kind of low-bar um, measure, but that's what, what we have right now. And it's different for the young kids, of course, because it's a developmental concept. But this is an area of innovation for measurement that we're very, very focused on. Other questions? I've got one. Okay. It may be a little bit different, and okay. maybe maybe it reflects my my time at the Gates Foundation as a funder. Um, but if if Michael Liu had 
$50 million mm -hmm. to give to the kind of work that you're talking about and gave you that money, how would you spend that? Well, one thing I would do is I would definitely look at the workforce and the maternal and child health workforce and others and make sure that this kind of knowledge and training was integrated in a very profound way, um, whether it was in home visiting or um, you know, maternal and child health workers. So that's one piece of it. The other is the innovation and the innovation network models that we actually take the many, many evidence-based programs around nurturance that we have and begin to bring them together and tie toward it, tie with it a very strong research and evaluation piece, which would probably before that, we'd have to develop that evaluation pack for measurement, which I think we can do, but it needs work. For example, executive function is an important thing to measure. It's very complicated. We can find a way to do that in a realistic way. And I would also look toward a public education campaign because I think there's enough evidence and um, that there really is just sort of a sense that we don't understand the requirements for our own well-being and that there's so much that every single person is doing every single day that can contribute to that. So those are three pieces. And then the last piece, has to be a very serious, ongoing, persistent effort to change policy and to really be at the ready with a continuous synthesis of knowledge and information so that we can't escape the realignment of our values, of, of how we spend our money and what we hold ourselves accountable for and, and the policies and the science. So those are four, four pieces. Great. <laughs> thank you very much. So, All right, go on. Again. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.